Amen. Thank you for our teenagers getting up there. That's quite uh, intimidating to get up and sing in front of you all. You're such good-looking people. And, uh, but thank you. Let's give them another great hand of appreciation. I want you to take your Bible this morning and join me in Revelation chapter 14. And we're going to be covering verse 8 through 10 plus chapter 20. So put your finger there in chapter 14 and uh, make sure that you go ahead and look up chapter 20 and verse 15. Revelation 14, 8 through 10 and Revelation 20 through 15. I want to read these verses and then kind of give you a quick overview of Revelation chapter 14 and dive into this all-important question. Does God send people to hell? Now, we have been studying this series about five questions about heaven and five questions about hell. Last week, we finished our fifth question about heaven, and today is our final question about hell. Not that there aren't other questions, and not that we would never come back and consider those questions, but for our particular series and study that we have been doing for the last few weeks, this will be the final question that we will address in this series. Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. The Bible says, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now I want you to go to chapter 20, verse 15. The last verse of chapter 20. The Bible says that anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 14 is an exciting chapter. It's an interesting chapter. When you study this chapter, you'll find that verses 1 through 5 describes the fate of the 144,000 that you may have heard of before. But perhaps out of context, we know the Bible teaches us that after the rapture of the church is the emergence of the tribulation period, which is for seven years. Within that seven-year period, God will raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists who will crisscross the known world, preach the gospel to every person. And every part of the planet, there is no person that will not hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. These men that God has raised up in the tribulation will be divinely sealed and protected as they carry out their ministry. You know that the Antichrist will be in full reign during the tribulation period. He will make every effort to stop the 144,000 evangelists. He will oppress them. He will oppose them. He will do everything he can to silence them, destroy them, and to kill them. But because they are sealed and protected by God, his Plans, meaning the plans of the devil and the Antichrist, will be thwarted. But as we study Revelation 14, we see that eventually the timing and the lifespan of these 144,000 evangelists will come to a completion. And then the Antichrist will be allowed to take their lives. In verses 1 through 5, we see them in heaven. 
we see them in the presence of Jesus Christ. We jump down to verse 14 through 20 of chapter 14, and we see the horrific battle of Armageddon that will occur at the end of the tribulation. Now, when people read the book of Revelation, they make the mistake of thinking everything from verse to verse to chapter to chapter is in chronological order, but that's not always true. So keep that in mind as you're studying the book of Revelation. And if you're like me, sometimes I have to have my study helps just to figure out where am I at and where am I at in the midst of the, the tribulation. Thank God, uh, realistically, I believe that we'll be raptured before the tribulation period because we have not been appointed unto wrath. And that the tribulation period is about calling the nation of Israel back to him. I hope you're your, your ears are open. I hope your eyes are wide open. I hope you're hearing and seeing the signs of the times that are all around us. One of the things that we know that is going to be a part of the uh, beginning of the tribulation period is that there is going to be a peace agreement signed by the Antichrist for the nation of Israel and promising them seven years of peace. Now, why would that even be necessary? It is because all the nations will rise up against the nation of Israel and they will want Israel to be destroyed. The Bible gives a promise in Genesis 12 that if we will bless God's people, his chosen people, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, that if we will bless them, then he will bless us. But we are in the midst of a time period in the nation of America where even our government opposes the nation of Israel. You should not be shaken. You should not be startled. You should know that the signs of the times are upon us and that it won't be long before Jesus calls the church home and we will be in the presence of God rejoicing, enjoying all that he has promised us while the tribulation period is unfolding here on this earth. We may not always like what we see. We may not always agree with what we see, but we need to have our spiritual antennas up and we need to be alert to what is happening so that we can make sure, A, that our heart is ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and that not only that we are spiritually ready, on fire, on the front lines, totally committed, fully devoted followers of Christ, not playing footsie with the world and not trying to keep the other foot inside the church, but totally committed to Jesus Christ, all in 100%. Amen. Go ahead. But the second reason that our antennas need to be up is because we have a responsibility to be a voice in the wilderness and we must tell our friends, we must tell our family, we must tell every person that crosses our path, whether they are strangers or people that we know, that the signs of the times are among us and we must be ready and we must implore them and plead with them to be spiritually ready for we are not ignorant of the schemes and the tactics of the devil. So in verses 14 through 20, this battle of the Armageddon that will occur at the end of the tribulation, we get some a little insight, but we jump back to verse 6 through 13, and it helps us to see the future, the future that awaits for two distinct classes of people. Verses 12 through 13 tell us the future of the faithful servant of God who endures, who is obedient, who will not quit, who keeps going on, who gets up every day and is committed to the cause and the purpose of Jesus Christ. But in verses 6 through 11, we learn about the future of lost sinners, a future that the Bible describes as a place called hell. The Bible describes this place as being a place where the cup of God's indignation 
or it is a place of torment and fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. We go on and we could read in verse 11, and it talks more about this place where the Bible says in verse 11 that the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. You know that in the tribulation period, the Bible teaches us that they will not be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. In today's terminology, we might say, you can't run to Walmart unless you have the mark of the beast. You won't be able to have your own business unless you have the mark of the beast. They'll be buying and selling, but it won't be for those who do not have the mark of the beast. Who are those who will refuse to receive the mark of the beast during the tribulation period? It is those who will come to Jesus Christ, who will believe in Christ, This is why your testimony now is so essential to your family and to your friends because as you are warning them, as you are pleading with them, as you are instructing them about what is to come and the signs of the times that are all around us, that even though they may resist you now and they may mock you or even laugh at you and think, I think dad has gone over and has lost it, There'll be one day that when the rapture takes place and they cannot find you and they are left behind, that the Bible says in Daniel 12, verse 2, that they'll be running to and fro. That is, that they'll be running everywhere they can to find the answers. And Daniel is reminded by the angels that the book of Daniel will be opened up and people will begin to understand what they're going through, what they're experiencing. And they're going to say, Grandma's right. We need to give our life to Christ. So much better to do it now than later. Can God's people say amen? Amen. So much better now, for today is the day of salvation. Don't wait, but friends, if you do choose to wait, I want you to know that it's not going to be an easy road. It's not going to be an easy life. You say, well, my life's not easy now. Friends, it'll be thousands of times worse in the tribulation period. Because if you become a believer and follow Christ and you refuse to take the mark of the beast, then you will fall into the category of Matthew chapter 25 when the Bible tells us that I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. Who are these people? I was in prison and you visited me. Who are these people? We think that they are people of today, certainly applicable, certainly is something that is scriptural and teaches, we are taught in the scriptures, but particularly in the context of Matthew 25, he is talking about the tribulation period and he is talking about those who refuse the mark of the beast and this is their plight and they will run to the hills, they will have to hide from the Antichrist because his wrath will be upon this nation and he will want to destroy anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and they will be thrown into prison prison, they will not be able to eat or drink, and they will not have any clothing, and they will not be able to buy or sell because they have the mark of the beast upon, uh, they, they do not have the mark of the beast upon them. And it'll be those who will step up and put their lives on the line to visit them, to clothe them, to minister to them. They are the ones that God will honor and some will become martyrs. And when you get to Revelation chapter 6, you see some of these martyrs around the throne and saying, Lord, when will our blood be avenged? When will you make right every wrong that is happening in this world? God promises them that he will, 
but it'll be in his timing and his way, and it'll be in the scope of what he is doing in this nation. And friends, the Bible teaches us, according to what we just read in Revelation, that those who receive this mark and those who refuse to follow Christ and those who refuse to believe in Jesus Christ, that they will be cast into the lake of fire. We shared with you a few weeks ago that we do not believe this lake of fire is a metaphor. We do not believe that it's something that Jesus was speaking in symbolism, but rather it was literal. That as Jesus describes the uh, place called hell, and as we read the scriptures over and over, we are reminded that it is a place of torment and ever and ever. So we have this question about hell. And it is an often asked question whether God could be a loving God. And that if he is a loving God, how could the doctrine of hell be true? This is an issue that troubles many people. It is so much of a hurdle for many people that they will just reject the doctrine of hell. They'll just say there's no way that the love of God is compatible with there being a place of hell for those who do not believe in Jesus Christ. Some even dismiss Christianity altogether and refuse to believe in Christ because they will not believe in a God that sends people to hell. Now, some would say that if you believe in a God of love, if God wants all the world to be saved, and if he is not willing that any should perish, and if he gave his own son to die for our sins, how can it be that any would perish? Why wouldn't everybody just be saved? What kind of love sends people to an eternal lake of fire. The Bible teaches us that God created hell. He originally created hell, according to the Gospel of Matthew, for Satan and his demonic angels who rebelled against him in heaven. A third of the angels were cast out of hell, but not only will we find that there are demonic angels in hell, but we will find that there are humans. God never intended that you and I, that humans would go to hell, but here we are. The Bible teaches us, Jesus says, there's only two ways. There is the narrow way. And there is the broad way. The narrow way is those who believe in Christ, those who follow God, those who are fully devoted followers of Christ. And then the broad way is those who walk the way of the world, live selfishly, do what they want, could care less about God or Jesus, want nothing to do with Christ. The broad way would also include those who are religious, They are religious on the outside, but there is no relationship with Jesus Christ in their heart. Jesus said in Matthew 7, he said to those who were listening to him, Depart from me, you that work iniquity, for I never knew you. My friends, you get to heaven by who you know, not by what you do. Jesus already did all the work on the cross, and you must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That relationship may have uh, high moments and low moments. It may have an ebb and flow to it, not because of Jesus, but because of our hearts and because sometimes of our struggles and sometimes because of where we're at in our faith, in our maturity. But I promise you, my friends, that if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what, church? Yeah. And so that's the most important thing. We'll get back to that, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, which I tend to do. My wife says, Mike, stick to the notes. (laughs) Stick to the notes. So three perspectives on this question that we have before us. Does God send people to hell? 
The first thing I want you to see this morning is that God's attribute of love is consistent with hell. We have a harmony of God's love and God's justice. We have a harmony of God's love and this place that is called hell. And I think no better verse captures that than Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 in which the Bible says God commendeth his love towards us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much does God love you, my friends? So much. He wants to keep you out of hell. He gave his life for you. He took the punishment. He took the pain. He took the very wrath of God upon him so you and I do not have to and that by faith in Jesus Christ that is applied to our heart. Now the particulars may vary from person to person and society to society. But there is an agreement among all society and most likely all people that things that are wrong or what people do that are wrong should be punished. That evil must be judged. I mean, there is a sense of justice in each of our hearts, right? Because that's why you stand up when you read the news or you, you see it on your social media feed or you see it on television. That's why you stand up and say, it's just not right. Well, where did that come from? For God has created within us a conscience and he has established within us a moral compass that the things that are wrong, somebody's got to stand up and somebody's got to say that it's wrong and then it must be dealt with. We think about drug dealers, rapists, murderers, serial killers, corrupt politicians, greedy people who get their way and they, 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 uh, they push on people, take advantage of people, and, and, they create, and they create injustices in our hearts. We know that they must be dealt with and that they must be punished. I appreciate Brother Arnold reading Romans 5 because it's such a beautiful text to understand where you and I are at. And I want you to understand that all of us are under the wrath of God and condemnation because we are sinners. We are sinners. And I know some of you say, man, Mike, I'm a pretty good guy. I do all these things. And you got your 10 good lists that you're doing, and I'm here, and I'm with you, and I'm glad that you're doing those 10 things. But listen to me. Our righteousness doesn't even come close to the righteousness of God. The prophet Isaiah said that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And I know you don't like me to talk about it, but it's true that you got to understand this is not the rag in your kitchen that you've been washing dishes with for the last 30 days, and I would recommend that you put it in the laundry. <laughs> ladies, you're killing us. And guys, I know, not, not just ladies, excuse me. Mike, I am so out of touch. I apologize. I apologize. So out of touch. But this is the rag that the lepers would use to wipe the pus off of their skin. Their skins would be filled with boils. They would wipe it off. And you would think that somebody would come along and they would give them a new rag and they would put it in the laundry and they would clean it up. But no, this is the same rag that one leper after another was used to wipe and they would come and they would take that same rag and wipe it again all over their body to wipe that pus off. And here's what the Bible says to us. That our righteousness, the best of Mike Sanders, is nothing but a filthy leper rag. The best of Mike. Wow. I know it's hard to swallow in this self-esteem world that we live in when everybody is so proud of themselves. And every once in a while somebody will tell me, and I was just talking to somebody, and they were telling me how good they were. And I said, if you don't say so yourself. (laughs) Amen. The Bible says, let another man's lips praise you. 
But we often jump in, and I find myself there. You know, I do something, and I say, honey, isn't that nice? I mow that lawn. Look at that lawn. Isn't that nice looking out there? And uh, she reminds me, let another man's lips praise you. <laughs> I said, I was hoping your lips would. <laughs> but here we are. Mm. We are sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all flawed. We are not perfect, and this sin must be dealt with. It must be paid for. And the way that it is dealt with is through God's holiness, and Jesus delivered us. And how did he do that? By going to the cross, being our substitute, taking our place. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. How is the love of God and the holiness of God, how are they compatible? And how are they in harmony? Because though we are sinners... And though we deserve to be in hell because of our sin, out of great love, God has reached out to us and he has provided a way for us to experience the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and that he has taken our punishment on the cross. He has taken our pain. And if we would put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then my friends, we can experience the true love of Jesus. If you have ever doubted whether God loved you, I want you to look to the cross. If you have ever doubted whether God cares about your plight, look to the cross because Jesus, on full display of love, he gave his life for you and for me. Can God's people say amen? amen. Oh, yeah, I love it. Now, God's provision for salvation should ever put to rest the notion that God's love and wrath or holiness are incompatible. I want you to understand that. That unlike us, God can do two things at once. Amen? I was taking prayer requests this morning, and some of the people that usually do that, we have a little Facebook thing where we keep track of our uh, prayer requests for each other in our Sunday school class. And now Pastor Mike was listening, hearing, trying to type on his little phone to get it in there all by himself. And I told him, I said, look, you guys are slowing down. You got to slow down because I can't take all this at once. It's too many things going on. I got to slow down one thing at a time. Ladies, I'm not talking about just manhood. I know you ladies say, well, we do all kinds of things <laughs> at a time. I hear you. But God can love you. And God can still punish sin. Did you know that? It's true. So the second thing I want you to consider this morning is how can a God of holiness admit sinful people to heaven? Now the Bible says that God loves us. But the Bible also declares that God is not only God of love, but he is a God who is holy. And someone says, well, pastor, how can a loving God send people to hell? Well, let me just invert it for you because this is the greater question I want you to consider. How can a God of holiness admit sinful people into heaven? That's the greater question. That's the most amazing thing to me that I'm not worthy of heaven. I'm not worthy of salvation. I am not deserving. I didn't go to church enough to say, God said, would say to me, hey, Mike, because you came 50 times out of the year, then you get a straight pass into heaven. That's not how it works. Even if I came 52, and even if I could find a 53rd and a 54th Sunday, and I came all those extra times, and I got bonus points, it still would not be enough to get me into heaven because the best of Mike is nothing but a leper's rag. And therefore, the greater question is, how does a holy God allow sinful people into heaven? Isaiah when he was in a moment of a crisis in his life. 
when the king who he had ministered to personally and he had become great friends with, King Uzziah had passed away. It was devastating because it was a tragedy. It was a surprise. It wasn't in something that he was in failing health, and all of a sudden, King Uzziah is gone, and Isaiah is overwhelmed with grief and sorrow in his heart. He shows up at the temple in Isaiah chapter 6, and he is prostrate before the Lord, weeping, pleading with God, and just expressing his grief and sorrow. And the Bible teaches us that he saw God high and lifted up, and around the throne of God were Sarah angels that were crying out, the scripture says in verse 3 of chapter 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. What you and I have to learn, it's easy for us to want to put most emphasis on the love of God. But what we really need to do is balance our understanding of who God is. Yes, he is a God of love, but friends, we cannot forget that he is a God who is holy. And think about this. In all of the Bible, you'll never find the angels circling the throne, crying out, love, love, love. But every time that we are given this picture and this scene, not only in Isaiah, but as well as in Revelation, we see the angels crying out, holy, holy, holy. In the Hebrew language, the repetition is a point of emphasis. It is a, not only a point of emphasis, but it is a point of priority. What I want you to know and understand, church, is that the preeminent Attribute of God is holiness. That it is out of his holiness that all of his other attributes flow. That we must first know and recognize that we have a holy God who is righteous, who is just, a God who is above us. Now think about this. The Hebrew word for holiness has the idea of being a cut above. Sometimes I always will speak, when I speak to the staff, I will always remind them, leaders need to be a cut above. Leaders need to be a cut above. You say, Pastor, why do you dress like, why don't you come in here like a slouch? Why don't you come in here with your pajamas? And why don't you come in here with your sweats? Now, if that's you, you do you, okay? I'm not putting you down, okay? But I'm the pastor. And I'm not gonna come in I don't want to offend anybody, and I don't want to send anybody out and upset, so i got to be careful what I say. And I know it's a different generation, but it's okay. As a leader, I want to be above, a cut above, not better than. But when you think of God, it's not that we think of God in terms of man, kind, but we think of God in terms of how the Bible has revealed him. He is a cut above us. He is a holy God. We cannot retreat from that church and we cannot back down from that and we cannot say, well, out of great compassion and love, we want to bring God down to us. No, my friends, I want you to exalt God in your hearts. I want you to exalt him in your mind. I want you to revel in his holiness and his greatness and as A.W. Tozer said, his transcendency. And I know you're like, what's that? That is that God transcends and be, he is be above and beyond all that we could ever imagine and think this is how great God is. And so the greater question is, how can God, a God of holiness admit sinful people to heaven? My third and final perspective that I want you to consider this morning. When we ask the question, does God send people to hell? My answer to you is God sends no one to hell. And that is that those who reject God choose to go to hell. They choose to go to hell. The notion that God sends people to hell might be accurate in this sense. That as we read in Revelation 14, 10, that they were cast into hell. Did you see that? They were cast into the lake of fire. 
Every once in a while, somebody will say, I want to go to hell. No, you don't. And when that moment comes and the smoke of that torment is coming up, I promise you, you will have to be cast. But what is it that would lead to the casting? What is it that would lead us to this point? It's not that God sent anyone to hell because people send their selves to hell by the choices that they make. Ralph Powell is a Bible scholar, and he said this, if the question is raised, how can a loving God send men or people to an everlasting hell, it must be replied that God does not choose this destiny for men. They freely choose it for themselves. God simply concurs in their self-chosen way, and he reveals the full consequences of their choice. God loves us. And he loves us so much that he has reached out to us to offer the opportunity that we could avoid hell, that we could escape hell. But it is out of this love that he also gives us the freedom to make our choice. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why would Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7, why would he keep saying that there was two ways and there were two people, one built their life on the foundation of a rock and another person built it on the shifting sands of the world? Why does he keep offering these two options? Because he is saying, you have a choice. You have a choice. A musician named Marilyn Manson, she said, I'm going to say hell would probably be more comfortable place for me because everyone I know would be there. I wouldn't really be allowed to do anything in heaven that would be any fun. And it's sad to read those words because she has made that choice. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah that the prophet said, And now, because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising early and speaking, but you heard not. And I called you, but you answered not. You remember the story of the great banquet in Matthew 22? You remember that the man invited everybody to come to this great banquet, and nobody would come. And so he decided to go out into the highways and to the hedges. He invited his family. He invited his friends. And they said, no, we're not coming. So he went and he invited everybody else in the world. It is a picture of God who has invited all people to come. He is invited. The scripture says in Matthew 22, verse 3, he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. And I wonder how many people there are that still will not come. No matter how many times the offer is made and the option is put before them and the pleading is put before them and the effort is made to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ that they will not come to Jesus Christ. So the answer to the question, why would a good God send people to hell? Is simply this, he doesn't. But he will let people go to the place that they choose. Hebrews 2, 3 sends out a warning to us. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it is attested to us by those who heard. Friends, I'm here to tell you how will you escape? I mean, you have this great opportunity, but you keep saying no, and how will you escape? The results and the consequences of rejecting Jesus Christ, you say, but listen, my parents are leaders in the church. My parents are active in the church. I cut my teeth on the pews 
of this church. Surely God would let me in. No, my friends. God has no grandchildren. He only has children. And no matter who you are, just as I always told my kids as they were growing up, you don't get to go to heaven because you're the pastor's children. You have to make a personal decision with Jesus Christ. You have to follow Christ. Repent and believe. However you want to term it, the Bible uses many terms of what it means. But you must be sincere. You cannot ride on the coattails of your family. You can't ride on the coattails of the pastor, an elder, a deacon, or any other church member. You must come to grips. And parents, I want to tell you, and I am startled by this, by how many Christian parents today have never had a heart-to-heart conversation with their children about where they're going to spend eternity. You talk about being a missionary, and you talk about reaching the world, but why don't you start in your own home? How many parents have 100% assurance that their child has responded to God in an affirmative way? How many of you have sat down with them And you say, what do you mean, Pastor? I'm talking about one-on-one, face-to-face, not being afraid to talk about spiritual things to your children, because I'm going to tell you, nothing is more important. Nothing is more important. I mean, I know you'll talk to your kids, and you'll say, do you want to play soccer? Do you want to play baseball? Do you want to do dance classes? Do you want to be a ballerina? And I think all that's wonderful, and I'm all in. But have you ever asked your children? Have you ever asked them, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Have you ever asked your child that? Have you ever? There is nobody that has a greater influence on that child than you, Mom, and you, Dad. And if it's not important to you, I promise you, it's not important to the kids. And you say, well, pastor, they're too young. My wife was five years old when she came to Christ, when her mother sat her down and talked to her about her faith. Friends, kids are at different ages and maturity, so I'm all in. And all my kids were at different ages. But if there was anything that was most important to Terry and I is that all of our children would know Jesus Christ. And let me tell you this. I'm a grandpa now. And the most important thing is that all my grandkids, and if the parents won't, and they do, but if the parents won't, I will. I always told my kids when they were growing up, if you don't have a plan, I do. If you don't know what to do with your life, I do. And I would say that to anybody. If you don't know what to do with your life and you're in this limbo area, friends, I got a plan. I got a plan. And I know some of you don't like that, but I just am so certain that I know that God has a plan for every person in this life. I may not know all the details, but I know that God has a plan. And we're going to get on our knees, and we're going to seek God, and we're going to find that plan, and we're going to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. Listen to me. Every day, people choose to live their lives apart from God. And I want to tell you out of great love, God allows them. If they want to live apart from him for all eternity, he will get out of their way. He has done what is necessary for you to have eternal life. And now the question is, have we responded? I know this morning that the truth is jabbing at you. And I know it's uncomfortable And I know this is one of those days when you came to church and you said, man, the pastor's laying it on us. But the only reason I'm doing it is because I believe hell is real. And I don't want you to go there. And there's only one other person greater than me that cares more. And that is Jesus Christ. So I remind you this morning in closing that hell is there. But I also want you to know the cross is there. And if you would just turn away from sin and self and turn towards Jesus this morning, heaven can be 
your home. Let's pray together. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. It's no accident that you're here this morning. God's purposes are true. His plans are unalterable. His calls cannot be retreated. And this morning he's speaking to your heart. If you're a believer and a follower of Christ, the question is, are you all in? 100%. Fully devoted. Totally committed. Doing everything you can to get as many people to heaven as you can. If not, I encourage you in this moment right now while we're praying that you would dedicate your life to Christ and that you would surrender your heart fully to him that you would not be ashamed of the gospel, that you would commit to talk to your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your family. That even though they may not fully agree with you, that you at least would do your job and cast the seed in their hearts. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it is God's will because he is not willing that any should perish, that you give your life to Jesus Christ. And in this moment of prayer, you right now can simply acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And you can believe in Christ. Out of his love, he has delivered you from the wrath and the punishment of your sin. Not just yours, but certainly all of us. But we're talking about where you're at. But here's the key. You can only apply that if you call on the name of the Lord. If you believe in him. In your heart, would you pray right now and would you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins? Would you ask him to come in and be your Lord and Savior? Would you turn away in your mind from sin and selfishness and commit your heart to follow Jesus, wherever it takes you, that it means more than anything in this world to have the peace and the promise that heaven is your home and your sins are washed away, cast as far as the east is from the west. Heavenly Father, this morning, we come to you thanking you for your word We know that your word is piercing, God, because it's a living word. We know it's powerful, and we are grateful for its mighty work in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for exposing, for looking into our hearts. And we come this morning confessing because we're not perfect and we're in desperate need of you, God, and your grace. And we just want to be real with you and not pretenders. We just ask that you would wash us clean before you. That you would once again affirm in our hearts that you are with us and that you are for us. And that you would help us to be those devoted followers that you have called us to be. I pray, Lord, for those who are wrestling with the decision, the choice of which road to take, those who are wrestling to respond to you. I pray, Father, that maybe some of the things that have been shared is helpful to those who could not understand how you could love us, but also that hell would be there. Help us to know, God, you are not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. May you bless this congregation with hearts of repentance. May you bless our community with hearts of repentance. May you give us the gift of faith that we may follow you in obedience. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ and God's people said. Amen. Thank you for being here. Aren't we glad that that series on hell is over?